Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It is difficult to read the opening words of Paul in chapter 2 and not be moved by the deep feeling expressed in those words penned so long ago. The yearning and earnest desire of the Apostle's heart is palpable. If you listen, you can hear the tone of a father pleading with his children. His words take on a soft, tender note to them as he breathes out his prayer that they all might have the same love one for another. I can picture in my mind this great man of God, a prisoner at Rome, knowing full well that he must soon give a defense of the truth he loves before earth's greatest potentate, which would likely cost him his life. Yet his mind is not burdened by his own fate, but with the well-being of those souls whom Christ committed to his care. Like his master before him, Paul knew that he must soon be taken from them, and his heart's desire is to see the Spirit of Christ fill every heart and unite them all in the bonds of Christian love. This deep longing of heart that he had for these believers at Philippi still shines as clear and pure as the noonday sun. This deep desire for unity of mind and purpose among the saints is a theme that the Apostle Paul frequently expresses in his letters. It was chief among his heart's most ardent desires. He longed to see this evidence of Christ in them. It was truly the joy of his heart. It was this grand truth that the Apostle termed a mystery among the Gentiles, which he says is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That this great truth might become a reality in every believer is the true heart and soul of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet what is this most precious truth if it is just a theory, a lifeless tale that we tell, a sweet song that we sing? How can it transform the world if it does not first transform us? What the world needs is a living, working manifestation of that truth which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the hope, the want for which the world is dying. It is what Christ Jesus is anxiously waiting for, for when he shall see his own character reflected perfectly in his people, then he shall come. Yet, as in anything worthwhile, it will require us to spend much time with the one we seek to emulate. It will require the heart's devotion in earnest, persevering effort led by His Spirit in order for the principles and truths contained in His Word to become a living part of our lives. Without Christ's mind in us, we will never become those living epistles read and known of men. I would like to begin by turning our attention to our key text in verse 5, where we find the expression let this mind be in you. This expression is a prime example of one of those instances where a literal translation of a word from one language into another is quite difficult and sometimes almost impossible. And what makes it all the more difficult is that this word mind, together with its counterpart in the Greek, phroneo, is one of those words that has many meanings. It can be hard to know just what sense in which the translators were applying it in any given text. 
and while the translators, I believe, chose the best word, which conveyed the thought as simply and accurately as possible into English. Yet it is nigh impossible to glean all the rich meaning that word conveys with but a passing glance. We must spend a few moments considering it, if we hope to comprehend its meaning and importance. Thankfully, this work is made easier by the fact that this word is a frequent use in the New Testament. With such simple tools as a concordance, we can easily compare how it is translated in the various other passages of the New Testament. We will not be considering all of these passages, for that would be unnecessarily repetitive. There are four passages in particular that will allow us to gain a good understanding of this word. Each of these texts translates this one Greek word, phroneo, by a different English word or phrase, that when compared with its translation in Philippians 2.5, gives us a clear insight into the precise meaning of the word mind, as God uses it. The first of these texts is found in the last chapter of the book of Acts, and verse 22. Here the Apostle Paul is being questioned by the Jews of Rome with regard to the doctrine of Christ. And notice how the word phroneo is translated into English. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. In this passage, the word phroneo is translated by the English verb thinkest. Here we find its most basic meaning, that of thinking or thought, or more precisely, what we think about. And as we all know, what we think about is inextricably connected with our feelings, which brings us to our next text. Here we see how this word for nail also relates to the emotional connection we have about the things we think. It's Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. When we fall in love with someone, we can't stop thinking about them. These fond, loving thoughts we call affection. These affections are what cause us to form a strong emotional attachment or bond with people, places, and ideas, etc. We typically associate affections with fond or good thoughts. But if our thoughts or experience surrounding a person, place, thing, or idea are unpleasant, they will form an equally strong emotional or physical distaste or dislike. And these affections are what motivate our lives. And this brings us to our third text to consider, where inspiration shows us just how these affections play out in the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The expression, they that are after the flesh, literally means those who live according to their flesh. It expresses the truth that our affections unconsciously affect how we live. For if we think only of ourselves, the inevitable result will be a life lived according to the flesh. That is, we will mind the things of the flesh, or act out the lusts or desires of our flesh. This is the inevitable next step, and all of this is conveyed in this one word, mind, the Greek word for nail. We can see in all of this just how this word mind, or for nail, conveys the entire process in the formation of character, for how we think determines our feelings or affections, and those affections are then acted out, and these actions form habits, which ultimately form our character. Perhaps now we are beginning to see just how important this little word mind really is, and why the Apostle Paul gives it such stress in all of his epistles. Character is therefore the end or goal of it all. Herein we can see just how true it is that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Everything begins in the mind. Therefore, to have the mind of Christ is to develop the character of Christ. And it must also then be clear that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if we are not Christ's, then we are the devil's. For said Jesus, He that is not with me 
is against me. There are therefore only two possible characters that we can form. We will either think, feel, and act like Christ, or we will think, feel, and act like the devil. This is because there are only two minds or spirits in this world, and so there are only two characters possible for us to form. And this brings us to our next or last text, Philippians 4 and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now, at the last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Here is the mind of Christ. It is that mind wherein the law of God is written, that law which commands us to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. This is why, when asked what was the greatest commandment of the law, Jesus responded by quoting from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. This is one of the many instances where we can clearly see how that the teachings of Christ and his apostles in the New Testament were nothing new, but were the reiteration of the great truths proclaimed by the prophets of old. This is because they were themselves inspired by the mind or Spirit of Christ. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. In Leviticus 19 and verse 18, we find the golden rule for all our dealings with our fellow men. It shows us how to love our neighbor as God would. It teaches us to think of what we would want done to us where our circumstances reversed. It requires us to think as God thinks. This is why God admonished the children of Israel not to avenge themselves, nor bear any grudge, but to love their neighbor as themselves. By bearing grudges and holding on to the wrongs of others, we are loading our minds with evil thoughts, and in so doing, we are unconsciously tipping the scales of our minds toward evil. I have often heard it said that we must love others more than we love ourselves. And while I understand the principle, it is nonetheless not what the Lord himself declared. Christ Jesus did not say we were to love our neighbor more than ourselves, but as, or equally. He declared that we are to love others to the very same degree that we love our own selves. Jesus is not promoting self-hate or loathing, but rather a healthy love, one that loves all equally without partiality and without hypocrisy. He shows us that true love nurtures a healthy self-respect or self-love because it doesn't love self more than another, but as or equally. And if we love others in this way, we will inevitably do for them the very thing we would have them do for us were we in their place. Therefore Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, sums up the true heart of the law when he declared, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It is just such a mind as this that makes a man righteous or just, because it makes him fair, impartial, or equal in all his dealings with his fellow man. When we show unfairness in our dealings with our neighbor, we show that we love self more than our fellow man. And such a mind is truly warped and unbalanced. It is unjust. This is not the mind of Christ, but the mind or minding of self. It is the mind of God's enemy. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. But thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Here, Jesus reveals to us the source of Satan's enmity toward God. It came from his heart or mind. This is the mind of Satan. He sought to justify his own course of sin and sought to make God responsible for his own evil course. This is the source of the mystery of iniquity and it is rightly called the mystery of iniquity, not because it cannot be understood, 
but because no reason or excuse can be given for it. Could we excuse our wrongs? They would cease to be sin. And God, in his infinite wisdom, has revealed just what this mystery of iniquity is, in all its deformity, by the very word which he chose to define it. It is that word, iniquity. And he chose this word because it properly describes the root cause of all sin. The word comes to us from the Latin, and is a construct of two parts. The prefix in, meaning not, or un, and equus, meaning equal. Thus, the word literally describes something as unequal or not equal, that is, unbalanced or unjust. This is why, if something is not equal, we say it is unfair. This, too, is why the balances or scales are typically used to represent justice, for they stand as a symbol of equality, showing the impartiality of the law, that law or justice favors no side, but deals equally in all things. True or just balances weigh all things equally. If we desire to be just or fair, we must have the mind of Christ, for a just weight and balance are the Lord's. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Justice and equity belong alone to God. If we would be like him, we must first learn to think as he thinks and feel as he feels. Our prayer must be, Lord, help me to think and feel, not as I would, but as Thou wilt. This need in man has been expressed by God in one word, repentance. Only through sincere repentance, a true and genuine change of heart, can we receive the mind of Christ. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our greatest need is to adopt a new way of thinking, God's way of thinking, one that looks out for the well-being of others, that cares as much for the feelings, opinions, and needs of others as it does for its own. This is why the Apostle Paul pled so earnestly, saying, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. We need to first strive against our own sin, and not with another's. If we are focused on overcoming sin in our own lives, we will have no time or interest to delve into those foolish and unlearned questions we would be better off leaving alone. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. A Christian strife must be against sin, that sin that so easily besets him. And only when he has plucked that beam from his own eye will he then seek to help his brother or sister with their moat. He will deal tenderly and gently with the erring. He will show a corresponding aptitude to teach and instruct others in the way of righteousness. He will be patient, not hasty in his judgment, but with meekness instruct those who oppose him for the purpose of leading them to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The mind of Christ does not think of itself more highly than Scripture warrants it. It is a lowly mind, not base or immoral, but humble in its opinions and judgments. It is severe upon its own faults, yet will manifest charity and mildness in its judgment of others. It is quick to observe its own defects and deformities, but is ever ready to overlook and make favorable allowances for the defects of others. It esteems the good in others above that which is in itself. This, too, 
is the mind of Christ. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. The verb translated look, scopeo, from which we get our English word scope, expresses more than just a passing glance, but the directing of the attention upon something. Just as we put scopes on our rifles in order to help us direct our focus upon a target, even so we are to look out for or direct our focus not upon our own affairs, but upon the affairs of our fellow men, not as busybodies in their matters or affairs, but as one who genuinely cares for their well-being. This selfless care for others is beautifully expressed in Paul's heartfelt words to the believers in Corinth. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. We have seen just how simple and beautiful the mind of Christ truly is, and how it applies to us both spiritually and practically. Yet, though the development of such a mind is simple, it is anything but easy, because it goes against our very nature. It is contrary to all our inherited and cultivated tendencies, yet it is the very thing we most desperately need. Without it, the soul is empty and vain. It is earthly, sensual, and devilish. We need that heaven-born principle at work in our lives, yet it comes at a cost. The mind of Christ must be learned in the school of Christ by earnest, painstaking effort, day by day and moment by moment, striving against our own perverse wills and desires. It is by taking up the cross of Christ and following Him. This is why Jesus said, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now I don't want to give anyone the impression or idea that our willpower and effort alone are sufficient to form in us the mind of Christ. Nothing could be further from the truth. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Unless our wills are subject unto Christ and all our efforts are guided by his Spirit working in our hearts, all our work will have been in vain. It must be God who is working in us, and not self alone. This brings us to the conclusion of the whole matter. And we will be concluding by returning to where we first began. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The key or operative word in this verse is the often overlooked word, let. If we do not let or open the door to Christ, nothing will work. It is therefore the key that unlocks the heart's door to Christ. Without our letting, it all comes to naught. Christ is right now standing at the door to our hearts, seeking entry, but unless we open to him and let him in, he will never make his abode with us. Christ Jesus will never force an entrance into our heart but awaits our invitation. Unless we invite Christ into our hearts by his spirit or mind, that perfect work will never be done in us. It may be done through us, and it may be done all around us, but without Christ within, it will never be done in us. And this great truth is expressed in one word found in Philippians 2.13 that we read earlier. It is the Greek word energeo, from which we get our English word energy. In that verse, this word is translated worketh, and we all know how energy works, right? How that it works and empowers from within? That's because energy is the product of what we put into our bodies. If we provide our bodies with good nourishing food, we can then expect a corresponding level of energy. So it is with regard to the mind of Christ. The word energy itself tells the story, for it is made up of two parts, the preposition en, meaning in or inside, and the verb ergo, meaning to work. The word therefore perfectly describes that great truth, that it is Christ working in you 
that is, in your heart, which is the hope of glory. It speaks of his power working from within. It reveals how that only as the power or mind of God works from within us can we truly be made into the likeness and image of God. His Spirit may affect us from without, but it can only change us from within. We must let or invite the mind of Christ into our hearts each and every day so that His infinite power may work in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Dear friend, have you invited Christ into your heart today? If not, won't you do so just now? It is never too late. Shall we pray? Our most loving and gracious Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of your dear Son, Jesus, and plead his precious blood. Please forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for not inviting you into our hearts. We are truly nothing without you. Please send us the Comforter, the Spirit of your dear Son, Jesus, for he is the vine and we are but branches. We need his life-giving sap, his precious blood coursing through our veins. Dear Father, please send the Spirit of your dear Son into our hearts just now, that he may work in us both your good will and pleasure. For we ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.